Good morning, everyone. All right, listen, I appreciate y'all coming in here and listening this morning. And, uh, you know, I really want to commend you for taking your time out of your full schedule and your busy lives to even attend this event, right? Uh, My name is James Nethery. Just briefly, 25 years as a life insurance agent and investment advisor. I was 14 years into my successful practice before I discovered the infinite banking concept. And I must say that this is not a creation of the life insurance companies, Wall Street. It's not the latest sales gimmick hoisted on the unsuspecting American public. Right? This was discovered at the you and me level. So it was created from the ground up by a longtime real estate investor and a life insurance agent. And, um, uh, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do today is go through the basics of the infinite banking concept. That's why it's an introduction. And then I have an exa- an existing client in the real estate business. I mean, we have a lot of them, but I brought his actual, um, policies here as a case study to show you the power of the infinite banking concept. And I would encourage you all to, uh, Write down maybe Banking with Life, jamesnethery.com, theinfinitebankingconcept.org, and do your homework on this concept, right? The challenge that I have, I feel like, is bringing together the concept because this is counterintuitive. It's the exact opposite of what you've been taught about life insurance, money, financing, and banking. So there may be a little bit of unlearning. Just take your time to do the unlearning and the discovery of this concept without a prior contempt. Okay? And then I'm just going to try to blend the concept and the numbers together. And then I've got a real estate application. It's my personal opinion. If you don't understand this concept, the details don't matter. If you do understand the concept the details don't matter. However, if the details are, is your money, I understand it's very important. Okay? And feel free to ask questions at the end. They've allowed me an hour. The time's running late. You know, I'm not a preacher like the guy last night, but I can go on and on. But I've got 59 minutes here, and it's a plethora of information. And you can debate me anytime after this one hour, Try to prove me wrong with the numbers and concepts. As a matter of fact, if you can find something wrong with my numbers, please share it with me. All right, but I'm going to start with qualified retirement plans as a basis of understanding and comparison because this is where all of America has been taught to build their wealth. And I'm going to mainly talk about traditional IRAs. I'll talk about Ross in here. But the majority of Americans' wealth is held in their qualified retirement plans in their primary residence. So, the qualified retirement plans beg three questions. Number one, are taxes going to go up or are they going to go down in the future? That's a bona fide question. Up, of course. I've got a 1913 1040 form, 100 years of taxation. The IRS was started in 2013, so we've got a couple of Years and on top of the hundred, but I want you to look down here. You could earn the first twenty thousand dollars in income in 1913, income tax free. Then you only paid one percent between twenty and fifty thousand in income. The top tax bracket was six percent, and that's if you were earning over five hundred thousand dollars in 1913. If you want to compare those numbers today. It would be the equivalent of earning $125,000 in income tax-free. Now, for the last hundred years, there's no question that taxes have gone up, they've gone down, the brackets have changed, the exemptions, the deductions, the exclusions, the carryovers, everything has changed. The net effect at the you and me level, we are paying more in taxes. So the second question is, would you rather pay taxes on the seed or the harvest? A little or a lot? A little. Exactly. I agree. Now, numerically, if I have a consistent rate of return, a linear rate of return, if I'm going to earn 7% year over year for the next 100 years, this wouldn't matter. 
But none of us earn linearly. We earn, we lose, we gain more or less. In that situation, it does matter when you pay the taxes. The third question is, is a dollar worth more today or in the future? Getting ahead of myself. Bonafide question. Today. It's always today. How many candy bars could you buy when you were a child? For a dollar? A ton? How many can you buy today? Not very many. We all know we should be eating healthy. You know, I'm fat for a reason. I'm using candy bars. I know I should be buying apples. Right? Right. You can only buy one today at the dollar store with a dollar. Of course, you know, really an apple a day keeps the doctor right away. Trust me, I work with the doctor, board certified general physician or surgeon. Um, you want to stay away from those guys, right? Okay, a dollar's always worth more today. Now look, the qualified plan violates those three basic truths that we just went over. If your underlying asset or investment is successful, it's going to grow, you're going to pay taxes, uh, or you're going to be in a higher tax bracket if your underlying investment is successful. You're going to pay taxes on a larger amount. And then the dollars at the time of withdrawal are worth less than the dollars at the time of contribution. The qualified plan violates those three truths, but everybody's putting their money in qualified retirement plans. My hat is off to you. You know, you're outside of the box stinkers. Part of the reason I'm here is I want to be around people like you, right? Iron sharpens iron. You're here because you believe with your investing skills in the real estate, you can earn a higher rate of return than the financial guru some 3,000 miles away that's managing your qualified plan, right? I agree with you. I completely agree with you. Even if you have a Roth IRA, that third truth is violated. The dollars at withdrawal are worth less than the dollars at the time of contribution. So all of the dollars that come out of the Roth, yeah, they're tax-free, but they're worth less. Then your income levels potentially phase you out of the ability to participate in a Roth. And then a Roth conversion is always taxable. Not a big deal, in my opinion. I'd rather pay taxes in a known bracket than an unknown bracket. Right, So not only are you deferring the taxes on a qualified plan if it's traditional, you're also deferring the calculation. Now if I take a side note, look, the qualified plans became really big in the late 80s. Remember the Keo plan, the Keo plan, they come around to where you're working. If you'll work hard, save 10%, get a tax deduction, and defer the taxes, you'll be retiring as a millionaire. Right? That's, that's why... That's why the majority of our wealth is in a qualified retirement plan. Now, wait a minute. The IRS is giving me a deduction because federal government's concerned that I'm not saving enough for retirement and I'm going to be a dependent upon them, right, in my retirement. Now, if they really had my best interest at heart, wouldn't they just give me a tax deduction today or lower my taxes today? Of course they would. That qualified plan is... is Dang near an asset of the IRS. But this is what we're taught to do. Put your money in a qualified plan. Now let's take a little bit deeper look at that. Oh, i got to mention here the self-directed IRAs. You tell me how more and more onerous the regulations are becoming on self-directed qualified plans. Roth or traditional. It's not going to change. You know, an entity that can't regulate or control itself is going to continue to expand. Right? They don't have the ability to control themselves. Let's take a closer look at the qualified plan. I'm starting young. I'm using a guy or a person, age 19 and a half. They go to work. They start uh, participating in a qualified plan. So for the next 40 years, they've locked up their money because you can't access that money through withdrawals without penalties. All right? All right. The penalty is 10%, and then you pay ordinary income taxes. Okay, now I'm a real estate investor, and I want to go get a higher rate of return. i got to go get a third-party administrator. There's nothing wrong with that concept, but you tell me who controls that loan. right? Maybe I just want to go to my qualified plan administrator and borrow the money. Who controls that loan? Right? Okay. But once you reach 59 and a half years of age, you enter into this magical 11-year period. You could take as much out as you'd like, as often as you would like. 
There's no penalties. But it's ordinary income taxable, 100%. Twice. I'm sorry? Twice, yeah. yeah, at least. There's more to come, right? Tax two and three times. How many times do you want to pay taxes on a dollar? Zero. Thank you. Maybe once if, if we have to, right? All right. After 11 and a half years, you're 70 and a half. I'm illustrating that you're living to 100, then I'm going to kill you. That 30 year time period, if you don't take out the qualified or the required minimum distribution, you'll be taxed up to 50% of what you should have taken out but did not take out. So who's controlling that? Okay, so that means 80 to 85% of the time the owner is in a penalty phase. Here are some fidelity statistics from 2009 and 2010. They said 45% of all plan participants liquidate fully or partially prior to retirement. All right? And oh yeah, 2008 and 9. That statistic went up to over 70%. Now why would that be? Why, if I'm saving for retirement and I'm separating myself from the capital on purpose, why would I access that capital and pay all those onerous fees and lose 35, 45% of the money? Because life happens, right? They had a health issue, they changed jobs, they moved, they lost their job. They had to. That's the qualified plan. Just, I understand y'all know this. Y'all are going to know a lot of what I cover. You're going to have an idea of a lot of what I cover, but I think I'm going to share something new with you too. All right, so my question here is, who is that designed for? That's an easy one, right? It, it is not designed for you. It's not designed for your family. It's designed for Uncle Sam. All my questions are really easy. I have, only have one trick question in this whole one-hour presentation. All right, and I promise you, I'm not the best speaker in the world, but I have spoke a lot. Uh, you know, I'm an easy, nice, you know, guy. Easy going. A little participation would be beneficial for all of us. We're all here to learn, and I promise I won't hurt you. Okay? Okay. All right. It's a deal. Look, the, the qualified plans violate the law of use, too. You tie your left arm behind your back for six months, and you tell me if you can use that left arm in the seventh month. You cannot. All right? And I understand y'all are aware of this. Y'all are getting, if you have money in qualified plans, you're using that capital with your own God-given abilities and talents. My hat is off to you. You're going to do much better than any financial guru can do for you. Right? No question. I'm just saying there may be a better way. So, 80% of the time, you're in a penalty phase. In addition, you tell me who pays all the fees. Who takes all the risk? Right? It's always you. Okay. That's the comparison. I'm comparing the infinite banking concept with a qualified retirement plan. The genesis, the foundation, the creation is the man who wrote this book, discovered this concept in 1980. He published this book in 2000. Here we are in 2016. How many of y'all in the room have heard of the infinite banking concept? Becoming your own banker. Perfect. And I know some of you are participants. Good. But you're still outnumbered. Right? The majority of us have not. 14 years in my profession, not a slouch, million dollar round table producer. I've written and owned lots of financial products. 14 years before I discovered this. And I discovered it because I bought the book and read it. Uh, so having, having read that book several times, I think it's amazing. Uh, one of my concerns is that one thing that I thought these people get away from how awesome it is, the government will try to regulate the staff. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think the government can do anything. It does not have the ability to restrain itself, and it's probably a matter of time where it happens in my lifetime or yours. But I believe that the government is going to go after the easy money first, and they're going to go after your qualified plan money before they come after this. By the time they get to mine, I'm not going to have a dime in there. They're going to show up, and there's going to be an outstanding loan for a liability. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So now I want to consider taxes, inflation, and lifestyle. 
There's a lot of numbers here. It's a small screen. You probably won't be able to see in the back. I'll verify all these numbers, but you know, so just go with me on the numbers. They're, they're in fact true. I'm taking a 30 year time period in the upper left. I'm illustrating a $100,000 annual income. Doesn't matter if it's single or joint income. And I'm illustrating that you have the ability to earn 5% on your money, not your real estate investments. I'm talking about your operating account that you operate from when you do your real estate business. Does that make sense? I'm not comparing this to the returns in real estate. I'm comparing this to your savings account, your checking account, your CD, your 401k that you're just borrowing money from. Okay? All right. Now I have a 30 year time period. Look, the further I go out, the better it is. No question. Would you agree with me that that's an exponential curve? Of course it is. All right. Now, $100,000 in income, 30 year time period, 5% earnings rate, no expenses. You would accumulate $6.9 million. Well, you know you can't earn $100,000 without paying taxes. So I'm going to use a 30% time uh, tax bracket. So over that 30 year time period, I paid $900,000 in taxes at a 30% rate. $900,000 by volume. Okay? That $900,000 destroyed over $2 million in wealth. Taxes destroy wealth. As a matter of fact, onerous taxation is nothing more than outright theft of private property and redistribution of wealth. That's all it is. Let's be honest. All spade a spade. Okay, so that $6.9 million, just because I pay taxes on it, is now only $4.8 million. But I paid $900,000 in taxes. I get to maintain my property. The IRS isn't putting liens on anything. Okay? Now I have debt service. Nelson, in his book, Nelson Nash is the author of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. You can go online today, you can Google it up, do a little research or gathering of consensus. You'll find a lot of things, good and bad, about the infinite banking concept. Nelson created the concept and wrote that book. Everything else that you find online is going to be a Me Too, a copycat, and some are outright bastardizations, good and bad. He proves, though, in his book, That the average individual, you and me, and I know y'all are above average, so I'm the average guy in the room, okay? 34 and a half cents out of every dollar that goes through your hands goes right through your hands in debt service. Either lost opportunity costs or outright interest payments going away from you. So I round it up because I like round numbers and I use 35%. So when we add the debt service in, At 35% over that 30-year time period, that drops your accumulated account at the end of that period to $2.4 million. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry, can you remind me what is Interest that you pay financing your automobiles, your home, your vacations, or lost opportunity costs, the interest that you could have earned otherwise. Okay, you're doing that at what rate? 35%. Perfect. Look, I'll prove all the numbers. <clears throat> okay. And now I'm using 30% in lifestyle. 30 cents out of every dollar that goes through your hands goes right through your hands to lifestyle. What kind of car do you drive? What kind of house do you live in? Where did you get a college education? Where do you go on vacation? What kind of clothes you buy? Where do you shop in restaurants? All right. Now we can move these percentage points around all day long. But that takes your account value down to $348,000 on $100,000 earning a year over a 30-year time period. That's less than three years of income in retirement. Right? Now look, if I use 30% in taxes, maybe you're not in the 30% tax bracket. I bet your debt service is higher. Maybe you're in a higher tax bracket. I bet your debt service is lower. If you add that up, 30, 35, and 30, that's 95% out of every dollar, or 95 cents out of every dollar that goes through your hands. That only means, that just means you're only saving 5%. The average savings rate in America today is under 4.25. I'm being generous here, is my point. Okay? All right. Does anyone in here know what the rate of inflation is? Do you even believe the numbers that you're told? Thank you. The Department of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Labor Statistics from the Department of Labor. 
They say inflation is between 1% and 2%. They've changed the methodology of inflation or calculating inflation twice, one in the 80s, one in the 90s. If you want to use the original methodology to calculate inflation, go to shadowstatistics.com. John Williams is a, an economist. He uses the old methodologies to, to calculate today's inflation rates. And he will show you if you use the 1980s method, we're at about 9%. If you use the 1990s method, we're at about 7%. You've got to get your data from somewhere, right? I'm being generous, and I'm going to use a 5% rate of inflation. Now, if I factor in inflation on top of my lifestyle, my debt service, and taxes, I'm now down to under or just over $80,000 in my account, from $6.9 million to $80,000. Right? Okay. Now, what if you could learn how to operate in a tax free environment? But maybe you can't get it done over the next 30 years. Maybe you don't have 30 years. I'm sure I don't. But what if you could? Oh, no, wait. Here, let me back up. The financial guru says today, well, your problem is a 5% rate of return. You gotta take some risk and you gotta make some money. You gotta make at least 10%. 10% long-term growth stock mutual fund. That's what I did in this slide. I just said, look, we keep all of these numbers the same, all the expenses the same, keep inflation the same, but we earn 10% a year for 30 years, year over year over year over year. You could accumulate a little bit over $209,000. All right, so now I'm gonna go back Oh, I've added one more because it keeps getting better. On the radio, Susie Orman, uh, I don't know who all they are, but they say, look, 10%, are you kidding? You can get 12% in a long-term growth stock mutual fund. So that's what I did here. What if we went out and earned 12% year over year over year? That would take you to a little over $300,000 in your account value. Now you tell me, can you go find a 12% rate of return year over year over year over year over year for 30 years? Even in real estate, can you do that? 30 years. I hope you can. Now I'm going back to zero. 5% savings rate or earnings rate, and you're saving or I'm still using 5% inflation. But now I'm saying, look, what if you could operate in a tax free environment? Not tax deferred, but tax free. You may not have 30 years left. So I'm being generous. Let 50% of the time or a third of the time, even a third of the time you could operate in a tax free environment. That would reduce your taxes, but without changing your cash flows, that would create $242,000 in, in that account. Okay? Now I'm saying that, look, you can learn how to become your own banker. What if you financed your own debt service? What if you captured some of that 35 cents that is going away from you without changing your cash flows, without working harder, without flipping any more homes, without buying any more homes, without hiring any more employees? Just controlling where your cash flows are coming from, going to, in a tax-free environment. And then what if you learn to finance your lifestyle instead of cutting your lifestyle? Now, I don't want to eat beans and rice. I'm telling you, I'm fat for a reason. I don't want to tell my wife she can't drive a nice car. I don't want to go to the cheapest school in town for my children. Right? That's just me. But instead of cutting my lifestyle, I finance my lifestyle. That takes my account to over $766,000 from $80,000. Now, have any of y'all ever heard that life insurance is a hedge against inflation? Perfect. Even all the guys that raised their hand a minute ago with infinite banking didn't raise their hand. I think I can prove this. What if I could eliminate, mitigate, or at least reduce inflation? That alone takes the account, the account value up to $3.3 million. All right, now the comparison here is how much would I have to earn in the market or in real estate or whatever else, your operating account, to get to $3.3 million? I'm going to put the taxes back at 30, the debt service back to 35, the lifestyle to 30, keep inflation, keep the time period 30 years, the income's all the same you would have to earn over 23% a year, year over year over year. Now you tell me if you can do that. I don't know. I hope you can. Okay. 
A lot of numbers, and I'm going to run through this, I'm telling you. I'm going to share a lot of information, but these are the basics. Now I'm going to look at two foundational concepts that you have to be okay with or understand or wrap your mind around for the infinite banking concept to make sense. Number one is you finance everything you purchase. You either pay interest to someone else when you formally finance, or you give up the interest you could have otherwise earned by paying cash. There are no exceptions whether you recognize it or not. It's an ec economic truth. So we're going to talk about the debtor versus the cash buyer for a minute. Have a baseline of zero. Here's the debtor. He doesn't have any money. He uses somebody else's money, makes a cash purchase with somebody else's money. Then he makes loan repayments till it's paid off. That's how he lives his life. That's how he makes purchases. All right? Here's the cash buyer. He doesn't want to pay anybody interest. He saves up his money. Then he makes a cash purchase. And that's how he lives his life. Pays cash. You can't pay cash with your own money unless you've saved it up, unless you've accumulated it. Right? Unless you've, you know, created some capital formation to make a cash purchase. And you, you did, if you didn't do that, you're using somebody else's money. Right? Okay, so this is the way he lives his life. They both get to the same place. They both wind up at the same place. Now, you remember that exponential curve I showed a minute ago? Would you agree that that's an exponential curve? Okay, I'm going to prove that there's an exponential curve with life insurance. There's an exponential curve with any kind of account, with any kind of a rate of return in time. Right? Okay. What if you could put this pattern, because isn't that a spending pattern? The borrower saves up money, then he spends it. He saves up. Isn't that a pattern in cash flows? And then, isn't it, doesn't it mirror the debtor? He's, the debtor's just using someone else's money. He makes a purchase. He repays it. Isn't that a pattern? Now, what if I put that pattern on an exponential curve? The cash flows didn't change. You didn't work any harder. You didn't buy any more real estate. You didn't hire any more employees. You didn't do anything different but control where your money is residing. The characteristics of that place, which is uh, comparable to a tax-free trust. Pre-engineered tax-free trust. Okay? So you just put the same spending pattern on that exponential curve. That's the only thing that changed. Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, wait. It's a new asset. It's life insurance, right? It's a new asset due to you. So you got to learn how to manage it. It's really, really simple. I'm, I, all I'm doing up here is complicating this concept, trying to convey to you the concept with numbers. I'm complicating it, I promise. When you first opened a checking account, you did not know how to balance a checking account. You had never used a, a registry, right? You got a new asset, you learned how to manage it. There's no difference here. It's a new asset. You learn how to manage it. It's really simple. All right. Now, the interest you could have earned otherwise. This is still two concepts that you have to be okay with that has to make sense to you for you to um, participate. Okay. I'm illustrating the interest you could have otherwise earned. I'm using the same 30-year time period in the upper left. I'm illustrating a 5% savings rate, or rate of return on your savings. And then I'm illustrating a $30,000 cash purchase. I don't care if it was an automobile, a vacation, a rental property, an option on a property, a piece of equipment in business. I don't care what it is. All of those things could either give you enjoyment or profit. You know, if my business bought a $30,000 piece of equipment and that would add wealth, because it can earn more money from that. I'm not including that. I'm just looking at the $30,000 cash purchase. If that $30,000 would have earned 5% over 30 years, it would have grown to $129,658. You have the asset. So I'm subtracting the cost, $30,000 out of that, and I've isolated $99,658. That is a lost opportunity cost. The interest that you could have earned otherwise by, by paying cash over a 30-year time period. 
Does that make sense? So the trick question here is, if you could recapture or capture the equivalent of that interest, would you want to? Of course you would. And if you would, how soon would you want to start to recapture that? Exactly. Of course. The infinite banking concept allows you to recapture the equivalent of that lost interest. Okay? Now, the second concept you have to be okay with, understand, feel good about, must make sense to you somewhat, is the banking process. I'm a generous guy. I'm illustrating a $100,000 deposit into a bank, and they're going to pay me 4% on that money. The question here is, do you know what the bank is going to do with your money? Of course, the bank does not lend their money. Their money is tier one capital on guaranteed deposits, earning guaranteed interest on guaranteed payback schedules. The bank lends your money. Oh, wait a minute. Before they lend your money, they inflate it. Right? They create money out of nothing, the fractional reserve system, and then they lend that pool of money. And I've just created six different portfolios. I've got an automobile loan portfolio. It shows the loans going out, payments coming back. I've got a home mortgage, line of credit, equipment, construction, commercial real estate. And I have assigned interest rates to these portfolios. This is as simple as you can get, in my opinion, on math. I'm just totaling up those interest rates. We know full well some of those loans are going to be paid. They're going to be refinanced. Some are going to be repossessed on the automobiles. The interest rates are going to change. Okay, But that totals up 44%. They're paying you for. The question here is how much more is a bank making on your money than you are? Come on, I've never hurt anyone. I promise I won't hurt you. Just somebody throw out a number. I'm sorry? The question here, the bank's paying you 4%. They're earning 44% on a simple calculation on the portfolios. How much more is a bank earning on your money than you are? Ten times as much. Wrong, 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 wrong. That's wrong too, but you're very close. Because I'm even wrong. The most common answer is 40. Right? Linear thinking. They're paying me 4. They're earning 44. The most common answer is 40. I'm saying it's a thousand percent. You're very close. I'm conservative here. The bank's making about eighteen hundred percent. Right? This was built in a higher interest rate environment. We're in a lower interest rate environment now. Banks make more money in low interest rate environments than they do high interest rate environments. Now I know you want to check the math. Here's the most common answer is math. Forty four minus four equals forty. Here's my math. Four times a thousand percent equal. Those are the simple keystrokes on a simple calculator. And I, you know, the mathematicians, you know, sometimes want to argue, but they agree. So the bank's making at least a thousand percent more than you on your money. Oh my goodness, the bank's doing something you can't do. You can't print money out of thin air, right? It's federal crime. It's counterfeiting. You're going to be in sing sing. No question. But every one of y'all drove here in an automobile today. There didn't a single person sleep in the rain last night. We've all had lines of credit, credit cards, equipment. We've all financed equipment or done some hard money lending on either side. Construction, student loans, real estate loans. So you can't print money out of thin air, but you can put your own money into motion. It's called velocity. Right? It's how many times can your capital, your money, how many times can your money run through your personal economy? And you can profit off of that. That makes sense? Velocity of money. It's an economic term. How many times can a dollar run through an economy? We all have a personal economy. How many times can your dollars run through your economy? So there, here's the trick question. Who would you rather be, the banker or the borrower? The banker, of course. You want to be the banker, the borrower, and you want to be the bank owner. Okay? So I'm going to talk briefly about banking with life insurance. We're going to wrap these details up. There's some mechanical things in here, but I'm putting enough information in front of you to this for you to decide whether you want to investigate further. Okay? Why in the world would we use life insurance? Well, this is how we're taught to buy life insurance. 
by the largest death benefit possible with the least amount of money. Pay, pay the smallest premium you can, get the largest death benefit. The first paradigm shift in thinking is we want to put as much cash into a life insurance policy as possible and by the least amount of death benefit. Do you know life insurance is tax-free? It's a private asset. It's a liquid asset. It's a non-countable asset. And you own it and control it. Okay? This is not the life insurance that comes to mind when you think about typical life insurance. Look, cash is king. The dollar, the U.S. dollar is still king. Cash has been king. The greatest real estate deal tomorrow could show up, ever. The first one to the deal with cash wins. All right? Cash is king. These policies are designed for cash. Your money must reside somewhere. This may be a place for you to consider and then use it as an operating account. So here are the mechanics. There's only, uh, we're going to cover insurance company structure, liquidity, how to keep a policy tax free. Where does the money go when you put money into an insurance company like this? And then we're going to consider whole life insurance as an asset class. We're going to hit the highlights. But it's, it's foundational. It's fundamental. There are only two types of life insurance companies in the world. There are stock companies. There are mutual companies. Economics 101 says 100% of the profits of a company goes to the owners of the company. Isn't that right? 100% of your profits of your company go to you. Why? You put up the capital. You created the product. You distributed it. It's yours. You deserve it. Okay. The question here is, who owns the companies? Stock companies are owned by shareholders. They get the dividend, they get the rise or the appreciation in stock value. They get the profits. Who owns a mutual company? Policyholders own a mutual company. Now, if I'm a policy owner with a mutual company, do I want them to be profitable? Yeah. Of course I do. Right? I own it and I want my share of the profits. Okay, we just want to use a mutual company. Now, liquidity. How much of my money can I get to? We're going to look at cumulative premium, annual premium, loss of liquidity, cash value, cumulative cash value, and here's a baseline of zero. Right? I put in $10,000 one year, and I'm thinking in premium, in terms of premium, not death benefit. I do not care what the death benefit is. In premium, on an annual basis. I lose the liquidity of $3,000 for a time period. I, yeah, this is cash. I'll answer all your questions at the end. I bet I answer most of them through it. Okay? I put in 10. I can't access 3. I can only access 7. This is where my brother-in-law says, my God, what did you do? You know what kind of commission that insurance agent makes? What's the company's name? What are they rated? Who are they? Where are they at? Right? The second year, I didn't listen to him. I put in another 10. Put in 10. Now I only lose 1000 on an annual basis of liquidity for a time period. Out of that 10000 8 went to cash. My math is off. We'll say I lose 2000 there. I put in 10 I can access 8. I put in 20, I can only access 16. I'm still behind. Right? The third year he my brother-in-law quit asking me. He quit hanging around me, right? And I didn't care anyway. I put in a $10,000 premium. I lost no liquidity. The whole $10,000 went to a cash value increase. I'm solving for cash. These policies are built to how, for cash. How much of your premium goes to cash? And when does all of your premium go to cash? How fast can I get to my money and maintain control? Right? But I'm still behind. I put in 30 I can only access 25. My brother-in-law never one time asked me, James, what did you do with that $25,000 that you had access to? Did you buy any cash flowing, appreciating assets like real estate? Never once did he ask me what I did with that money. Right? And you know, I, can, I cannot put the rates of return on that investment on a life insurance illustration. Does that make sense? Okay. The fourth year I put in 10. Now... $12,000 increase that year in cash value. Now I've turned the corner. I'm starting to become positive on an annual basis. Why in the world would anybody put any money anywhere and lose the liquidity of it? There's a reason. All right, so I keep paying the premium. It takes about eight years, sometimes seven, sometimes nine, eight years before all of the premium that you paid in is available in cash value. If you borrow 
or use this for financing and you practiced honest banking, you can make that crossover happen sooner. Okay? Now I'm just going to extrapolate this out. This is a real life policy. It's 11 years old. And, then, and these numbers are current. It's an 11 year old policy, but they're current numbers. How did this policy do? What's it going to do in the future based on today's economic environment? The lowest interest rate environment ever. In the 15th year, the premium goes in of 3,200. So the premium was reduced. 3,200 goes in. There's an $8,000 increase that year. In the 20th year, 3,200 goes in. There's a $10,000 increase that year. Is there anything wrong with that? And I can have all of that cash value outstanding in loans, buying, cash flowing, appreciating assets. And I'll get a step up in basis on that real estate too, won't I? And then that life insurance is tax free. Is there anything wrong with that? Would anybody in here write me a check today for $3,200 if you could come back in 12 months and get 10? Of course you would, right? Now look, Clyde, if you would do that, is there any reason why you wouldn't put 32000 in and come back and get 100000 If that's true, is there anybody that wouldn't put $3.2 million in and come back and get $10 million? Uh, Of course. You, you can only put in as much as you're comfortable with, as much as you can wrap your mind around. But once you give this an honest, thorough investigation, you'll clearly see you cannot put enough money in life insurance fast enough. It is not physically possible. Okay? So we look at the Met guidelines. The IRS looked at life insurance in the 80s and said, oh man, this is too good to be true. We're going to have to limit put some parameters on what these policies look like. And here's what they did. They created the MET guidelines, modified endowment contract. If your tax-free life insurance policy ever crosses this modified endowment line, modified endowment contract, if they ever cross that line, now a life insurance policy is taxed as an investment. All right? Those are the rules. We see where they are. We just want to avoid it. It's no big deal. They said life insurance has to have a relationship between the cash value and the death benefit. And I don't care how old are you are when you die, but it must pay a death benefit. It could be a dollar in death benefit, but there must be a death benefit paid. So if that relationship is maintained and a death benefit's paid, it's tax-free. Those are the IRS rules. I'm using um, age 100 here. They go to age 120 now. And if I have an old-fashioned policy built to age 100, I turn 100, I'll say, no, I don't want the check. Leave it in deferral. It'll keep earning interest and dividends, and I'll keep borrowing. It's not a big deal. It's easy. It's just different. No one showed you this before. Your life insurance agent doesn't know this because he wasn't taught this by the life insurance companies. It's not his fault. Okay, where does the premium go? This may be too mechanical, but I think it's important. There's only two components to a life insurance policy built this way. You have to buy a base whole life policy. I'm using age 120 as the whole life. There's no cash value in the first two years of cash value life insurance. There's no cash value in the first two years. But you get a death benefit. It earns interest and dividends, right? Um, the interest, of course, increases after two years. On top of that, we buy a paid-up additions rider. This is a cash component of the policy. You see how much bigger that is than the base? We're trying to get as much money into the PUA as we possibly can. It goes immediate, immediately, it goes to cash value, buys additional death benefit. It always earns additional interest and dividends. And if we have to, we'll take a little bit of premium, buy a term rider to raise the death benefit up high enough to maintain that relationship so we can get a lot of money in there and still remain tax-free. Now, is this complicated so far? I mean, I understand it's different, but I've not done anything above third grade math. Or ever. Mm -hmm. I'm just structuring the policy to remain tax-free and full of cash. Okay? Now, if we look at whole life insurance as an asset class, look, it comes with primary guarantees and secondary guarantees. Compare that with your other assets. Then compare the liquidity. I'm cash on cash after eight years, and then there's an exponential curve. And I'll show you a real life policy in a minute. You won't even believe the numbers. Then the uh, internal rate of return on a cash value 
there's an internal rate of return on the death benefit, and then there's also an internal rate of return on a cash flow. If I put a premium in, that's a cash flow in. If I make a withdrawal or a loan, that's a cash flow out. Isn't that a cash flow? Look, life insurance compared to real estate. Real estate is nothing but cash flows in a deferred benefit. That is all life insurance is built this way. Cash flows in a deferred benefit. It's just called a death benefit. And we're all going to die. It's okay. Right? Okay. So you just compare assets with all their characteristics. Now the requirements of a banking system. You want a dividend paying life insurance policy with a PUA rider. You want a mutual company. You'd like it to be a hundred years old or older or well managed, well run. You want it highly rated. You want them to accommodate the banking process. Let me ask you this. How much of your money does your bank want you to withdraw? None. How much of your money does your bank want you to put on deposit? All of it. There's some life insurance companies that have the same attitude. You just want to avoid them. You know, if I have a guaranteed contractual right to get a loan, but it takes the insurance company 60 or 70 days to process it, I miss the deal. Right? If they don't accommodate this process, you avoid them. It's no big deal. Then you design the policy for high cash values, low death benefit. You want to remain tax free forever and then have the dividends go to the paid up additions rider. I can summarize this in three steps. You want a well run mutual company. You want a properly structured life insurance policy and then you want to go use it. It's really simple. All right. So the uses of the infinite banking concept are only limited by your imagination. All right, now here we're going to get down to the meat of it. Here's some policies. This is a real, typically structured life insurance policy. And then I'm going to compare it to a policy that's structured for infinite banking. And this is a, like I said, it's a real life policy on a young man who's a real estate investor. He has one of the largest franchise uh, real realtors offices. Plus he buys and holds, plus he buys and flips. Okay? So this is real. Not making it up just for your benefit. But here's a typical life insurance policy. This is typically what comes to mind when you mention life insurance. This gentleman is 38 years of age. He's standard health. He's not preferred. He puts $40,000 in a year for seven years. I don't care if you move the decimal point either way. 4000 a year, 400000 a year, doesn't matter to me. Illustrative purposes. Right? He's putting in $40,000 a year. He would have $2,900 in cash value, and he'd have a $4 million death benefit, and it would take him 17 years before his cash value was greater than his cumulative premium. Okay? He said, well, man, I like this infinite banking. What does that look like? You pay seven years of premium, and then from the eighth year and beyond, the policy is paying its own premiums. Okay? So he pays 40000 a year. For seven years, he's put in $280,000. It takes him 10 years before his cash value is greater than his cumulative premium but he doesn't pay another premium. The policy, the premium is reduced, and then the policy pays a premium. Okay? From dividends and PUA cash value. And, and he can control this. He controls every bit of this. I want you to see that he has $256,000 at the end of year seven. Matt, what are you doing? I'm buying and holding. I'm buying and flipping. Where are you getting the money? I'm either paying cash or using somebody else's money. All right? Oh, now look, Matt, why don't you take a loan from this policy guaranteed by contract? You can get the check in three days. Go do your real estate business. Charge yourself 8.9%. He's the banker. You know a banker can do anything he wants to do? Now I'm going to play some games with numbers on a page. All for trying to convey this concept. We're living in a world obsessed with interest rates. That's the only reason I'm using interest rates. I want to focus on the volume, but I'm going to show you the rates, okay? Matt, 
pay yourself 8.9%. How many properties can you buy for 250000 I don't know, one or two. You tell me who pays the principal and interest on the loan. On a rental property. The renter pays the principal and interest. He's responsible for it, right? But the renter's paying it. All right, so now there's a cash flow. If you charge yourself 8.9% on a $250,000 loan, the $22,250 is the cash flow. You know the insurance company that you own? They don't, they're profitable. You got to pay them interest. Okay, you got to pay them 5%. Can you write that off? Sure, if it's a legitimate business loan, it's not a big deal. But 12500 is the number. That leaves you at 3.9% or $9,750 that the renter's paying for. The renter pays for the property taxes, the repairs, and he pays for everything else too. Right? Okay. Now, Matt, what do you want to do with that $9,750? You want to go put it in your bank so you can get, do the next deal? Or do you want to put it in your life insurance policy? Because if he paid a premium in the eighth year and beyond, that $9,750 in year eight turns into $18,900. Year 15, 97.50 turns into 26.150. Now you tell me, should he put, this is the same policy. Now I'm illustrating him putting that money into the policy. That's right. That's right. That's right. On a on an eight point nine percent loan. Yes, sir. Uh, year eight, nine seven fifty. How much you make on that loan? What's the twelve point? The I'm just saying. The, oh, good question. I'm saying that cash flow of ninety seven fifty goes into his policy in year eight. Yes, twelve months later, there's an eighteen thousand five hundred dollar or eighteen thousand nine hundred dollar increase in his cash value. Oh, after, after at the end of the year, right? Dividends are paid at the end of the year. All right, so where should he put that money? His bank or this policy? I don't know. He can do what he wants. Right? So what happened in year 15? There it is, 97 turns into 26. Okay? So now we're still... Now you tell me what the volume is on that. Figure an interest rate on that. If you put in 20 or 90, 9,700 in year 15 and it turns into 26, look, I've got all this cash value outstanding earning money in real estate or whatever it is I was going to do anyway. You tell me what a rate of what that rate of return is on a cash flow, right? Okay, so here's the same cash flow. Just charge yourself 8.9. The insurance company gets 12.5. That means 6.9 of that amortization is your money on that cash flow. What should you do at the 17,250? You should put it into your policy because if you do, 17,250 in year eight turns into 26,000. In year 15, the 17,250 turns into 36,000. Now you tell me, is that keeping up with inflation? If I put 17 in and I can get 36 out through a loan or withdrawal, does that keep up with inflation? Of course it does. Aren't I leveraging a, a cash flow and I'm controlling the cash flow? What if, what, what? I'm sorry. Yep. All right, what, what happens if you take the money out of, in a withdrawal versus a loan? You remember that exponential curve, right? If you take money out of there, you're going to neuter that curve. You're going to reduce that curve. So I've created an exponential curve, and I don't want to do anything to interrupt it. I just want to learn how to use it. <clears throat> All right, y'all, here, here we go. Look, I'm like, how much can you pay? Matt asked me, how much can I pay? You can pay anything you want. I'm saying charge yourself 20%. You're just putting more money into the policy. And as you're doing it, the increase is greater and greater and greater. That's all I'm trying to illustrate. What should you do with the cash flow? Where should you put your money? You should consider putting your money here than using your money. All right. Um, and, and this is just proving the numbers. If he put the whole cash flow in at, at almost 20%, 36,000 turns into 44 in year 8, 36,000 turns into 61,000 in year 15. And then it, here, here's a curveball. He said, same policy. He's like, James, I got $70,000 in a CD. Can I put that in there too? I'm like, yes, you can. It all went to cash. That $70,000 in eight years turned into $90,000. 
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. And if you think it was helpful, share it with a friend. If you want to see more videos like this, then subscribe down below and click the bell icon so you can be notified when we release new videos. And we are releasing new content all the time. Don't miss it. Thanks for stopping by.